It's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker this morning. He's a very dangerous man. It's not without uh, meaning that his last name is Wild. <laughs> he uh, used to write for one of the early Chesterton newsletters that uh, eventually led to Gilbert Magazine. It was a combination of three newsletters, the American Chesterton Society's newsletter called Generally Speaking, the very cleverly named Midwest Chesterton News, and then uh, the one that was published out of Ottawa, Canada, All Things Considered. And uh, Father Wilde wrote for All Things Considered, and his column was called Wilde About Chesterton. <laughs> See, and that's such a better title than Johnson About Chesterton. <laughs> but, and I, he was, uh, I was writing for Midwest Chesterton News. I was still a Baptist at the time. And, uh, and I was obviously hurtling towards the church with great reluctance. And I finally met Father Wilde for the first time uh, at a, a Midwest Chesterton conference in Milwaukee. And uh, I, had, you know, I, I never indicated what, what my religious affiliation was in my writing, but I had, I had written a letter or a, a column about why I thought Chesterton should be, be canonized. And I was a Baptist writing that. <laughs> and uh, when I first met Father Wilde, he said to me, Dale, what, what religion are you? And I said, well, I was a Baptist, but I decided to become Catholic. And he said, oh, good. I've been praying for your conversion. <laughs> so he's a dangerous man. <laughs> and uh, it's been a pleasure to, to uh, know him over the, the last several years. He is truly a a great spiritual warrior. He is the postulator in the cause for Catherine Doherty, the founder, foundress of Madonna House. He, he spoke at our, uh, our conference down in uh, Chicago this last uh, summer and uh, met Father Udris from, uh, from England, who is the investigator into Chesterton's potential cause. And the two of them really not only hit it off, but have become quite close. And it's, it's, it's just been a great boon to uh, Chester's potential cause for Father Udris to, to deal with a, someone who's a postulator in a cause. But he uh, has been a, a great Chesterton fan for a long time, a great promoter of, of Chesterton's holiness, and his book on um, uh, Chesterton's mysticism is one of the best books that I've read. And I'm very pleased, and please welcome Father Robert Wilde. First of all, I'd like to thank, thank you for inviting me. It's always a, a joy to uh, talk at a Chesterton conference. And Lou mentioned the, the stipend that we get. I mean, I got uh, travel expenses and $20 for lunch. <laughs> is, is there more coming? <laughs> <laughs> but despite that, I'm going to spend the whole day with you. Um, I'd like to always begin just with a moment of silence and especially recall the presence of the Holy Spirit. We're going to talk about actually the work of God in uh, our great man, Chesterton. And Jesus said the Holy Spirit would uh, teach us everything. So let's just pause for a moment and recall the uh, presence of the Holy Spirit. This is my first time at, uh, at John Fisher College, and it reminded me of one of my 
favorite stories. This is a true story from his life. Uh, perhaps you all know this, like reading Coles to Newcastle. But um, on the day that he was uh, to be executed, this is a true story, he woke up quite early in the morning and he asked the uh, jailer what time the execution was. And he said something like uh, 10 o'clock. And Fisher actually said, well, I'm going back to bed. Uh, wake me up <laughs> when it's time. This is really a true story. And why, why I mentioned it uh, today is it's kind of a Chestertonian story. Because as you know, Chesterton liked to stay in bed <laughs> for quite a long time in the morning. And I imagined him saying, I hope this is not an irreverent comment. I can imagine him saying, well, I've been late for many things in my life. I wouldn't want to miss this. <laughs> <laughs> so. I'm sure uh, Chesterton's cause uh, will be open someday. And what it is, the, the process will be concerned not so much with his uh, literary works or his social, social theories, but mostly with his understanding of the faith, at least as far as the church's interest is concerned, and with his personal life of how he, he lived the gospel. And I hope that both of my books, as you know, The Tumbler of God, Chesterton, as a mystic, topic of my talk this morning, and a book just recently published by the American Chesterton Society, Jousting with Satan, Chesterton's Battle with the Father of Lies. I hope both of these will be especially helpful for the cause, because they are concerned with these areas of our, our faith. In his introduction to the Tumblr of God, Stratford Caldecott, and let's keep him in our prayers, as you know. I like to say people fall asleep in the Lord. We pray that he will quickly come into the Lord's presence. He said in his introduction, until now, that is the publication of the Tumblr, we lacked a book that spoke openly of what is in the end the most important thing about him, his friendship with God. So I hope my two books may be helpful for, for the cause. The thesis of the Tumblr of God is that Chesterton received uh, a real mystical grace. Uh, this can't be proven, but an attempt can be made to demonstrate it. The church, for example, in a canonization process, uh, for example, Chesterton's, but we hope will begin someday, the church does not attempt to prove a person's holiness, but she attempts to demonstrate it through a person's life and their writings and the testimonies of other people. And so in this sense, I'm not trying to prove uh, that Chesterton had a mystical grace, it can't really be proven, but I'm trying to, to reasonably demonstrate it. And I'm not specifically concerned either with his holiness, although I believe that he was really a holy person. I make the point in my book that people, people can receive mystical graces, actually, that are not really a result of their holiness of life. We can give a lot of examples for that. And such graces are not necessarily a proof of their holiness, uh, either. And one of the reasons uh, for trying to demonstrate a mystical grace in the life of Chesterton is that when the Lord gives a special grace to people, it's often an indication of a special uh, mission. Mystical graces basically are given for others, for the person himself or herself, but basically for others. And so we believe, many believe Chesterton, one of the greatest apologists of the 20th century, perhaps, perhaps of all time, I think so. And that he possibly received the mystical grace can be seen as kind of a, a confirmation of this vocation that he had a special grace to see everything in the light and light of faith. Although there will be a strong intellectual content to my lecture, and thank God it's early in the morning and everybody is, is awake, 
My main purpose is to offer you an insight into this kind of mysticism, which I hope will prove helpful in your own life with the Lord. I'm going to define it basically as a kind of a lay, a lay mysticism. A kind of a lay mysticism. For most of our history, lay people have been trying to relate to the mysticism of the cloister, or of the desert, or of the pedestal of satellites. But I don't mean to, to minimize the value of these other mysticisms. They have guided the lives of innumerable Christians throughout the centuries. But Chesterton himself said that we need a new kind of saint. And I believe that we need also a new kind of mysticism and that Chesterton has given us, or rather the Lord has given Chesterton this new kind of mysticism. So my main concern in the book is not so much what Chesterton thought about this or that, he thought just about everything, but I'm interested, you might say, in the quality of his mind which led me and others to the belief that something more than deep intellectual thinking was at work in his amazing brain. And I was led to believe that his view of reality also involved a mystical grace. There's something more involved in his mind than simply clever ideas or philosophical insights. Some of you probably uh, know who Hugh Kenner was. He's a great literary figure in both Canada and the States. He wrote this famous book that's often quoted by Chestertonians, Paradox of Chesterton. And I use this uh, in my book in an early chapter called What Was on Chesterton's Mind? And to quote Kenner, quote, it may be said without exaggeration that Chesterton ranks almost with St. Thomas himself in the comprehensiveness of his initial perception, and that very certainty and immediacy which makes it unnecessary for him to struggle at any time with any truth. And then this phrase here, this places him securely, not in the hierarchy of artists, but in a hierarchy no less distinguished, the long line of exegetes and theologians who have successfully explored the same cosmos and the light of the same vision, seeing all things ordered and all things mirroring greater and lesser things. When, when I read that, probably 20 years ago, that phrase that he's in the hierarchy of fathers, philosophers, and doctors of the church, well, it was kind of a quantum leap in my understanding of who, who Chesterton might be. And then when I came across the fact that von Balthasar, in his volume two of Glory of the Lord, Studies in Theological Styles, he said he would have considered Chesterton worthy of the presentation. Unfortunately, he never got around to it. I wonder sometimes if there's any, any notes that he took for, for writing this, you know. But it would have been an incredible contribution to our understanding of Chesterton. And he, in his book, when Balthazar writes about Pegay and Bernanos and so on, yeah. and so my appreciation of Chesterton's mind kind of blazed ever more brightly. A Jesuit, Quinton Lauer, in his book *Chesterton Philosopher Without a Portfolio*, he wrote, he wrote, "There is in faith not only as Chesterton saw it, but also as it happened in him, more than just a hint of mystic vision." a scene of what rational mind all by itself could not fathom. In other words, another intuition of something more, more at work in Chesterton's mind. Father Ian Boyd, as you know, the director of the Review, he wrote, what is most needed for an understanding of Chesterton's work is a definition of the special religious quality which permeates his mind. Again, the same insight. And so what my book is about, I believe, is the special religious quality that Father, Father Ian mentioned, which permeated his mind. And my, my conclusion is that it was uh, a mystical, a mystical grace. And so after noting that there are others, and there's quite a few others who see something extraordinary about Chesterton's way of thinking, 
The next step is to try and define mysticism in, in some way. Karl Rahner, most of you I'm sure know him, one of the great significant Catholic writers, especially on mysticism, he's often called a mystical doctor by theologians and writers. He says, quote, there is no generally received theology of mysticism within the body of Christian theology. There is an extraordinary variety of descriptions and systematizations of mystical experience. And so my thesis is that Chesterton's mystical grace, it corresponds to a certain kind of mystical experience. There are many kinds. There's no one definition. And so very simply, I try and, and demonstrate that in Chesterton's view of reality, it corresponds to a certain kind of, uh, of mysticism. And so I don't want to use this word in any loose sense, you know, mysticism this, mysticism that, just like people use the word love these days. But I, I want to use it in a very technical sense, according, it's, it's, it's able to be found in our tradition. I don't want to use it in a general sense, but I want to, uh, I want to say that it's, it's something that we can find in our, in our tradition. Bernard, again, uh, I don't know how familiar you are with him, he's considered one of the foremost experts on Western mysticism. He has written up to now a five-volume series entitled The Presence of God, the History of Christian Mysticism. And several more volumes are planted. And as Dante took Virgil as his guide through the worlds of the afterlife, so I will be taking him again as my guide through the worlds of mysticism. I will be presenting some definitions, some definitions of mysticism that I believe can be applied in Chesterton. And this is from, again, this, Joseph Marischal was a prominent uh, Catholic uh, philosopher. <coughs> he wrote, quote, mystical experience, and this is a definition I believe we could apply to Chesterton, Mystical experience is the direct, intuitive, unmediated contact in this life between the intelligence and its goal, the absolute. And this line here, it is the intuition of God as present, the feeling of the immediate presence of a transcendent being. And this definition seems to me made to order for my purpose is good. It's this kind of experience. You can refer to your own experience of reading Chesterton. It's this kind of experience that I find articulated in Chesterton's writings. And to quote Father Rahner again, after speaking about the great Spanish mystics like Teresa and John of the Cross, he says, quote, besides this literature on the Spanish mystics, there's another body of spiritual literature which one may by no means ignore, in this phrase here, in which the mystical element thrusts through to expression time and again as the ultimate source of this litur literature's authenticity and vitality. I think that's exactly what we find in Chesterton's writings. There's some mystical element that thrusts through his writings, his poetry, his his vision of reality. And I will argue that the mystical element thrusts through in Chesterton's writing. And I ask you to consider especially this next remark of Father Nanner is they are, in my opinion, at the heart of Chesterton's mystical experience. Quote, in the mystical experience, the mystical subject, that is the person, undergoes an immediate experience of the very mystery, the sheer quintessential reality of God. Again, the emphasis is this experience of the presence. This is the subtitle of, uh, of this uh, many-volume work. Chesterton had some kind of amazing experience of the presence of God. And even more specifically, this comment applies to Chesterton. Perhaps one could conceive of a mystical experience of oneness between the subject and the world as such, which the subject might thereupon precipitously, precipitately identify with the oneness 
of the mystical subject with God himself. In other words, this emphasizes that, that a, a mystical grace can be your relationship with, with the Lord present in the world, not so much the inside the interior vision that you have. And I will argue that this is at the heart of Chesterton's mystical experience. He experienced God through his experience of the world. He experienced God through his experience of the reality that we call, call the world. Thomas Merton needs no introduction, and one of his comments is similar to Rahner's quote. There's another kind of consciousness that is still available to the modern person, which starts not from the thinking and self-aware subject, but from being. Ontologically seen to be beyond and prior to the subject-object division. This experience of being is totally different from an experience of self-consciousness. In much of our mystical tradition, the mysticism is about a person's interior self-consciousness, very elaborate uh, theological, philosophical, interior vision that we find in the writings. But my attempt is to show that Chesterton's mysticism centers on his experience of the God being in the world and being present in the world. And he doesn't develop kind of an intricate interior mental construct of seeing God in the depths of your mind. It's not, it's, it's, a, it's one of the valuable contributions of our tradition, but it's not, it's not Chesterton's kind of mysticism. Before we get into some of his writings, I want to make some brief connections between Chesterton's experience of the presence of God and what we find about Christ's experience in the Gospels. If we define mysticism as an extraordinary awareness of the presence, well, Christ then is the mystic par excellence, not only an experience of the presence, but he was the presence. I am the Father. I am the Father are one. And I want to emphasize Christ's great simplicity of the relationship with the Father, and that his experience does not conform to many of the characteristics of mysticism written about in our tradition, and neither does Chesterton's. <clears throat> For example, performing miracles is sometimes considered a sign of holiness or being a mystic. Yes, Jesus worked miracles, but there is a difference. There's not a lot of spiritual fireworks, you know. It's very, you know, I say to you, get up, arise, walk. It's almost a kind of a very natural kind of uh, performing these things. Uh, in, in the lives of the saints, as you know, we often see extraordinary uh, manifestations. But in, in the Gospels, there's a great simplicity of Christ uh, doing un unusual things. And when he prays, he is not transfixed in ecstasies or elevated up to now. Even in the Transfiguration, he's speaking quite naturally with Moses and Elijah. And he prays naturally as well, probably standing up with his eyes open, as, as was the Jewish custom. In other words, there's a tremendous simplicity in the uh, characteristics of Christ's uh, personal, personal life. And when he's asked to uh, teach us how to pray, he doesn't give, and again, this is not to knock these things, but he doesn't give complicated prayer techniques he just says, when you pray, say, Our Father, who art in heaven. In other words, the tremendous simplicity of, of the Lord's uh, interior life. When he speaks, when he seeks to raise our minds to God, he doesn't counsel closing our eyes and purifying our thoughts from all distractions. Again, you can find this all over in much of our mystical tradition. He says, look at the lilies of the field. Look at the birds of the air. And for his teachings and parables, he uses images from the ordinary life in the world. And so does uh, Chesterton. And in his book, The Everlasting Man, Chesterton makes this pithy observation. He says, relatively speaking, it is the gospel that has the mysticism and the church that has the rationalism. 
I attribute this to mean that Christ is the true mystic and that some, some theologians and philosophers in the church have turned his simple approach to God into complicated rational and theological systems. And such complications can often distance people from the presence. My main point here is that the simplicity of Chesterton's mysticism conforms quite well with the simplicity of the Lord's mysticism, his relationship uh, with the Father. But I would say what, what mostly now, what mostly led me to believe in a possible mystical grace that Chesterton might have received would how how he thought and expressed himself about his experience of reality, and especially about the experience of the saints. It is a commonplace in Chesterton's studies to say that when he was writing about a person, Stevenson or Blake or Dickens, he was very autobiographical, it's a common comment. And so he didn't write a book on mystical prayer or on mystical theology, but my contention is that especially in describing the inner life of the saints, he is describing his own experience of God and of reality. Again, that's my understanding. As you know, he's often autobiographical, so even when he's writing about the saints and their interior world, I think there's a lot of Chesterton in those descriptions. Looking at his insights in the life of the saints forms a major part of my demonstration. And the best place to begin is with his life of St. Francis. His favorite saint, my favorite book as well, the name, as you know, that he took for his confirmation. Great love, St. Francis. And the title of my book comes from Chesterton's description of Francis' mysticism. It was mostly this book that led me to consider the possibility that Chesterton also might have received mystical grace. It is in this book that I found what I call the essence of Chesterton's mysticism. So I present it now so that you can keep your mind as we go through some of his other writings. And see how this main theme applied to St. Francis is expressed in other ways in his, in his writings. The significant chapter is called Le Jongleur de Dieu. Chesterton says that the jongleur was properly a jocular or a jester. Sometimes he, liked, he was what we might call a juggler. Sometimes he may have been a tumbler, like that acrobat in the beautiful legend who was called the tumbler of our lady. So this is mine. And so when Francis called his followers the jongleur de Dieu, he meant something very like the tumblers of God. And Chesterton will then apply tumbling in a spiritual sense to St. Francis, which caused a completely revolutionary view in his vision of reality. As you know, Chesterton often recommended standing on your head and seeing the world as sort of hanging, depending on God, and he uses this image in reference to what happened to Francis. Quote, he might see and love every tile on the steep roofs or every bird on the battlements of the season, but he would see them all in a new and divine light of eternal danger and dependence. He would be thankful to the Almighty that it had not been dropped. And Chesterton has this expression that is very significant for my discussion, quote, it is also true that Francis sees more of the things themselves when he sees more of their origin. And then this, this line here, I think, is very, very significant for us. Chesterton says, for their origin is part of them, and indeed the most extraordinary part. In other words, we, we see things, and we say, well, God you know, created these things, the trees and the flowers. But Chesterton goes beyond just what we see. He says, Francis saw where they came from, that the origin of things is the most important part of them. Speaking again of the effects of this mystical accompaniment, Chesterton says, the saint in some mystical sense is on the other side of things. Again, it's getting at this, his, his awareness of being. The saint is on the other side of things. He sees things go forth from the divine as children 
going forth from a familiar and accepted home, instead of meeting them as they come out, as most of us do upon the roads of the world. In other words, we just see, see, see things that have been created, but Chesterton was aware of the origin of things, where they, where they came from. The saint sees things in their first act of creation, etc. you might say, as a finished product already made. And I think here Chesterton is describing his own, his own mystical experience, his own grace. Now this following quote about the mysticism of St. Francis, or what convinced me about his, his mysticism, is probably one of the best and most moving explications of his own mysticism, a striking keynote of which is praise. So I would suggest um, the next two quotes I'm going to read, that what, what says to me at the heart of what his mystical experience is all about. And so arises out of this almost nihilistic abyss that is the origin of things, uh, the noble thing that is called praise, which no one will ever understand while he identifies it as nature worship or pantheistic optimism. When we say that a poet praises the whole of creation, we commonly mean only that he praises the whole cosmos. But the mystic does really praise creation in the sense of the act of creation. And that's, that's at the heart of it. He praises the passage or transition from non-entity to entity. <coughs> the mystic praises the act of creation. And again, Chesterton, the mystic who passes through the moment when there is nothing but God does in some sense behold the beginningless beginnings in which there was really nothing else. He not only appreciates everything in this, this line here, but the nothing of which everything was made. In some sense, he is there when the foundations of the world are laid with the morning stars singing together and the sons of God shouting for July, one of his favorite quotes from Job. In this exquisitely, exquisitely mystical language, we have a superb overview of Chesterton's mysticism. Quite evident is his constant intuition of the amazing, uh, it is thereness of being. He was amazed just in the existence of reality. Ends. Equally, he is very much aware that at every moment, creatures are originating from God. And since every moment is witness to the action of God's creative power, it is no mere hyperbole to say that the true mystic is ever present at the foundations of the world. The creation is going on every moment. It's not something God did and then went someplace else. We're always present, and Chesterton was always present in his mind at the foundations of the world, at the moment of creation. So his mysticism consists of being aware that at every moment, and not just as we read in the book of Genesis, God is creating and suspending everything by his creative act. He says somewhere else that every week we should be celebrating God's creativity. As in the book of Genesis, every Monday we should have whatever it is, the day of life and the day of fishes and the day of animals, because that is actually happening every week. <coughs> so this intuitive awareness that all is hanging on God's power and proceeding from his pure graciousness lies at the source of Chesterton's mysticism. An even more exact way of describing his mystical grace would be this. A mystical awareness of the thereness of being coming forth at every moment. Not simply an awareness of being, but at every moment, being is coming forth from the creativity of God. My contention is that Chesterton is describing his own mysticism in his attempt to describe the mysticism of St. Francis, and that the immediacy and vigor of his description arises from the fruits of his own passionate experience of the present. So just to recommend that I think 
his book on St. Francis is the book to read as far as his, his mystical, his mystical gaze. And as you know, Chesterton found in St. Thomas a philosophical explanation of reality. One kind of mysticism, as I alluded to earlier, is that you turn off your mind, one kind of mysticism, and you remain in the cloud of unknowing, a title of a famous book by one of Chesterton's compatriots. He probably read it and uh, <laughs> disliked it immensely. The cloud of unknowing. You must get rid of all distractions, seek to contemplate the reality of God, which is beyond knowing. This is not the only trend in our tradition, but one of them. It was not <coughs> Chesterton's kind of mysticism. Because I believe he had what we theologians call the gift of knowledge, which has to do with seeing all of reality in the light of faith. And to exercise this gift, you have to look at reality, as Jesus taught us in short. You have to use your mind if you're going to see reality in the light of faith. You have to use your mind. I believe Chesterton identified more with Aquinas than with Francis. He probably loved Francis more. He once said he couldn't have become a monk because it's too, too strenuous a life. <laughs> but I think he would have found the life of Francis a bit strenuous as well. But sitting and thinking and dictating to three secretaries at once, as Aquinas actually used to do. Well, I think he could have handled that. Yeah. I offer just a few of Chesterton's reflections about St. Thomas that I contend also describe Chesterton's own vision of reality and consequently his mysticism. Both Thomas and, and Chesterton contend that human consciousness begins with the taste of the intuition of being. Quote, St. Thomas says emphatically, that the child is aware of ends, being long before he knows that grass is grass, or self is self. He knows that something is something. Da da da. <laughs> Perhaps it would be best to say very emphatically, as Chesterton has Aquinas doing, that there is an is. That is as much monkish credulity as St. Thomas asks of us to believe at the start. And so Thomas and Chesterton begin their journey into reality with the extraordinary awareness of evidence itself, of being. They believe we first taste with the totality of our faculties the elementary existence of things and see afterwards. Their mysticism is not a reposing in a kind of piece of timeless being, an interior vision, but in the actual tasting of reality, the actual tasting of reality. My contention is that Chesterton's intuition went beyond simple awareness of being. For him, just to repeat, it was the awareness of being uh, coming forth. And summing up the essence of uh, Thomism, Chesterton says, quote, he Aquinas, is arguing for the popular proverbs that seeing is believing, that the proof of the pudding is in the eating, and that man cannot jump down his own throat or deny the fact of his existence. Mere mystic is another tag Chesterton uses for mystics who are fascinated by the inner world that they construct more than by the amazing world they can see. So that's, that's the basic difference. Again, not to knock one of our great traditions, but instead of looking inward and creating this world within, his mysticism is awareness of God's presence in what he can see and taste. And as you know, he saw and tasted a great deal. <laughs> This is Chesterton. Everything that is in the intellect has been in the senses. This is where Aquinas began, at the opposite end of inquiry from that of a mere mystic, a phrase he often uses. The Platonists, or at least the Neoplatonists, this is Chesterton, all tended to view to the view that the mind was lit entirely from within. 
St. Thomas insisted that it was lit by the five windows that we call windows of the senses. But he wanted the light from within to shine on what, the light from without to shine on what was within. Mrs. Chesterton, man is not a balloon going up into the sky, nor a mole burning barely in the earth, but rather a thing like a tree whose roots are fed from the earth while its highest branches seem to rise almost to the stars. Because of his mystical intu intuition of the goodness of what he could see with their eyes, Chesterton was content to wait for the fireworks of eternity, but meanwhile he did not want to miss this world in some kind of premature anticipation of the next, that is, closing your eyes and imagining that you're in heaven already. He knew that what he saw with his eyes was not the whole of reality. Not all that he could reason to with his mind. He said once that this world is real, but it's not as real as it could be. I think that's quite, quite accurate. It's not unreal. It's real. Uh, but it's going to be a, a more real world, please God. He found the actual reality of the world more captivating and entrancing than an imagined or rational construct of the mind. For Chesterton, the light from without was more brilliant than the light from within. That's, that's an amazing difference. The light that he received from his experience of reality was much more profound than whatever material intuitions people might have. He did not wish to go up into the sky in a balloon before his time. The highest branches of his personal tree did almost reach to the stars anyhow. And he would wait for the real flowers, the actual explosions in the heavenly world for which he longed. Besides the lives of the saints, another source of insight into Chesterton's mysticism is his poetry. And I heard Dale, your first talk there was on the poetry of Chesterton. You read one line, you read one line and sat down. You know that? <laughs> Then he got up and gave a wonderful lecture on Chesterton's book. Besides the lives of the saints, another source of insight into Chesterton's mysticism is his poetry. I give just one of many examples. His poem entitled The Sword of Surprise, I'm sure many of you have read it, in which he is in awe of the splendor of his own body. He asks to be sundered, that is, separated from his bodily senses so that he may appreciate them more. So this is just one of many poems where this mystical element of his mind comes through. Sunder me from thy bones, O sword of God, till they stand stark and strange as do the trees, that I whose heart goes up with the soaring woods may marvel as much at these. And sunder me from my blood, that in the dark I hear that red ancestral river run, like branching buried floods that find the sea but never see the sun. Give me eyes to see my eyes, those rolling mirrors made alive in the terrible crystal more incredible than all the things they see. And then, after, and then the concluding stanza, which is a beautiful prayer for a compassionate love of oneself that asks for the grace to see ourselves as we see our neighbor. This is the final stanza. Sunder me from my soul, that I may see the sins like streaming wounds to life's grave beat, till I shall save myself as I would save a stranger in the street. Beautiful poem. In the book, I treat some other people whom Chesterton wrote about and who were considered mystics in their day, for example, William Blake and Tolstoy, the Franciscan Fratelli. But in keeping with my theme, they did not land on their feet in their spiritual tumbling, but they landed on their heads. We will not be considering them here, but in treating them, 
Chesterton offers some very deep insights into mysticism, true and false, especially in his book on Blake. If you're interested in this theme, read or reread again his book on Blake. It's just filled with uh, insights into true and false mysticism that I found very helpful. It seems that Chesterton really believed Chesterton, uh, Chesterton really believed that Blake might have had some mystical graces. But there's a fascinating section, but people like Blake, they were cut off from any tradition. They were born out of due time, and so he didn't have any help in discernment. But Chesterton thinks he might have received some mystical graces. I like the episode where little William told his mother he saw the prophet Ezekiel in a tree, <coughs> and his mother snapped him. And Chesterton said that was the end of his early mysticism. <laughs> <laughs> One of the mystics Chesterton thought did land on his feet was George MacDonald. There are recently discovered early writings of Chesterton that you can find them in the review if you issue that. And George MacDonald entitled George MacDonald the Mystic, early writings by Chesterton. And there, Chesterton defines a mystic. Again, this is, I think, autobiographical. A mystic is one who sees around every object a halo from the hidden sun. It's another way of talking about the origin of things. The mystic sees everything <coughs> surrounded by a halo from the hidden sun. He concludes, and this is I found surprising, the 19th century is a century of steam, of machineries, of board schools, of dark strikes, of journalism. But it is with all and above all an age of mysticism. Mystics abound in the century, and of them, Dr. George McDonald is the most remarkable. It's his tribute to McDonald. An interesting comment that Chesterton saw the 19th century as a century of mysticism. Well, then, he also was one of the most remarkable in that age of mysticism. If you get the chance, I recommend that you read Maisie Ward's introduction to her second volume on Chesterton's life, as you know, Return to Chesterton. And she talks about what she calls the high altitude of saints like Anthony in the Desert, uh, Francis, Catherine of Siena, and we include Simon Stylites, who is up pretty high. And then she says this, the question I should like at least to open is whether Chesterton had not both the deeper and greater mysticism. I found that really insightful, I didn't, you know, when it or something. A mysticism closer to that of the saints, and a message far more valuable for the millions, including us, for the millions whose place is on the plains of daily effort, and not on the mountains of asceticism and total renunciation. So, in a sense, she's talking about this lay mysticism. That's a good definition of what I would call his lay mysticism. For the millions whose place is on the plains of daily effort and not on the mountains of asceticism and total renunciation. I simply note that it is for the millions whose place is on the plains of daily effort. It's, it's great when you read something like that. Um, when I read that, it's, it's very encouraging a person who agrees with what he's saying. <laughs> Excuse me. But I found that very uh, confirming. That was what the, the book was about that I had been working on. Yes, I also conclude that Chesterton had been given the grace of the lay mysticism to the whole church. He is this herald of the mysticism for the millions on the plains of daily effort. Amazing Word also says, referring to the many verdicts she received from her readers, quote, one is struck by two facts, a universal agreement that Chesterton is a very great man, and the widest possible disagreement as to where that greatness lies. And so I will give my own opinion about that, that his greatness lies in the profound depth of his mind that was anointed by uh, this mystical grace that enabled him to, quote, see round every object a halo from the hidden sun, to see the origin 
the most important part of reality. This is another way of saying that he had the intense gift of seeing everything in the light of faith. A mystical grace was given to Chesterton to illuminate the daily lives of people in every aspect of life. And this is a very rare grace. Uh, personally, I don't know of any other person in our whole 2,000 year tradition who applied the light of faith to such a wholeness of the reality in which we live. As you know, as a journalist, he wrote and applied this gift to absolutely everything, everything that the millions on the planets are involved in. And as usual, Chesterton has the best insights about his life he wrote. Yes, in spite of the contrasts that are conspicuous and even comic, as the comparison between the fat man and the thin man, talking about Francis and Aquinas, these two great men were doing the same great work, one in the study and the other in the street. They were not bringing something new into Christianity in the sense of something heathen or heretical into Christianity. On the contrary, they were bringing Christianity into Christendom. Again, I think this is autobiographical. Chesterton describing his understanding of his own vocation. He was bringing Christianity into Christendom of his day. And he was doing it both in the study, like Thomas, and in the street, like Francis, Fleet Street. What Dorothy Sayers said of Chesterton's Christian teaching, I'd like also to apply to his mysticism. She says, he blew out of the church a quantity of stained glass of a very poor period and let in thus the fresh air in which the dead leaves of doctrine danced with all the energy and indecorum of Our Lady's Tumblr. And Maisie Ward wrote that, quote, there is more than a touch of Our Lady's Tumblr in Gilbert. And I believe it was Father O'Connor, I think, that in Joseph's book, he called Chesterton a uh, mystical jester. You could maybe call him the mystical tumbler. Finally, perhaps it may be understood, uh, this is a Chesterton, perhaps it may be misunderstood if I say that St. Francis, for all his love of animals, saved us from being Buddhists. And that St. Thomas, for all his love of Greek philosophy, saved us from being Platonists. But it is best to say the truth in its simplest form. <coughs> they both reaffirm the incarnation by bringing God back to earth. Chesterton was not bringing something entirely new into our mystical tradition. He was bringing mysticism back to earth. Thank you.